Uh, my name is Carly Meyer. I am the Communications and Policy Coordinator here at WIPCA. Um, I am on the external relations team with Rochelle and Sashi, who are both on the call and who I think most of you know. Um, today, we're going to go over Advocacy 101. So we're just going to do a quick what is advocacy tricks and tips overview. It'll only be about 15 minutes or so, very quick, um, just introduction to advocacy. And then we'll jump right into our panel with Jennifer Schilling and Mike Rohrcast. Um, I have their bios a little bit later in the um, in the presentation, and I'm sure that we are all looking forward to that. And then afterwards, we'll leave questions, um, time for questions, and then also a wrap up and thank you. All right, so when people hear advocacy, we tend to either get this look or someone who's super excited. So you could be on either end of this or in the middle of the spectrum, but um, these are some of the examples that we get when we say advocacy. So when people think advocacy, they might think of big rallies, of lawyers in courtrooms, um, of large podiums and speakers, or uh, law and order <laughs> and all the advocacy done there. But at WEPCA, our health center advocacy is very relational. Um, these are some pictures. Um, on the left-hand side, we have um, our groups meeting with legislators in the Capitol when it was possible <laughs> in person, um, but very um, laid back, um, very informational, and just like a conversation of all the great things that health centers do. And so we definitely just wanna lower the, um, <laughs> the anxiety that might be there of what's expected and really um, just open up a conversation with legislators. So health center advocacy, um, and we'll go through this. Um, it is educational, it is not lawyerly, um, it's mission-based, it's not partisan or based in political party. It, our mission is to improve health center um, through, excuse me, improve health work through the work of community health centers and their partners. It's not rigid or one size fits all. It is collaborative. It's based in relationships and it's iterative. It's constantly changing in the moment. So this is something that I'm constantly <laughs> on telling everyone is you are the best advocates for the community health centers. And it's why I bother so many people. You are the experts, legislators and policymakers and state officials really look to you all to make policies that work for you. And we really are always encouraging you to take the opportunity to inform them. So you are all the agents of change. And you really know what no one else knows. You have access to information that needs to be shared. And then as someone who gets very nervous, <laughs> um, my little advocacy tip, is, um, this is from Audre Lorde, but when we speak, we are afraid our words will not be heard or welcomed. But when we are silent, we are still afraid. So it's better to speak. And so you're all doing such great work and always encouraging you to just share those stories. Um, again, I am constantly bothering health center staff to, um, excuse me, there's chat, um, to uh, meet with legislators. And the reason is that as much as I'm sure they love seeing Rochelle in my face, they really, really want to see your faces and hear your stories. And um, this is very true. I'm going to keep pushing on it. So remember this, you are the expert. And then we have the virtual world. So what do advocacy meetings look like in this virtual world? So you'll be, um, we have our, uh, our meetings with legislators, our federal meetings are in two weeks, I think, next week. I'm not sure, I <laughs> need to check a calendar. And, um, and then at the beginning of April, we have meetings with our state legislators, which is super exciting. So with that, you'll be in a virtual room with these legislators and the community health, the other community health centers in your district. Um, WIPCA staff will be there to facilitate. 
but we'll also have specific asks for you. So no worries about what am I supposed to ask? Um, we're going to ask you to share information and highlights from community health centers, discuss issues and make your ask. And then really just having a conversation, answering questions um, and being really a resource for the legislators and their constituents who you serve. And then we're always um, there to offer follow-up as well. So now I'll get into a couple of <clears throat> tips and tricks. So some tips, um, know the name and don't assume the gender of your elected official. Um, using they or them is really great if you're not sure. Use the bill number and the companion bill number when speaking um, for something that has a bill. Um, it's gonna be one of the first questions, <laughs> easier to look up. And then just remember that staff influence policy and just be really happy to meet with them. Um, Jennifer uh, was having a discussion earlier about how staff helped out so much and it really is not a slight in, in the slightest <laughs> um, if you're meeting with staff instead of the legislator. And then always include your contact information. Don't wanna leave anything behind and then not know who to contact. We'll do a couple more tips is make your ask. So don't go into an office and leave without having asked for what you came for. Make sure it's clear and uh, you know, give it a few minutes to let it sit. And I'm sure they'll say that they'll get back to make sure that it was clear why you were there. Send thank you notes and make thank you calls and no gifts. The more local you are, the better. Uh, as we know, community health centers serve patients at every single county across the state. It's something that we're really proud of, um, something that you all do an amazing job of. And we just wanna make sure that the legislators understand the breadth that you guys have for taking care of uh, Wisconsinites. And then be on time, just a, always a friendly thing. So this I 100% um, stole from Mia Croyle from uh, Metastar, who was with us last year, um, but it was so great. And so there's a couple of ways where if the conversation is being steered in a way that isn't on topic, um, how do we respond? So here is one that says, I know the answer and this is on topic. So what are we going to do then? We'll answer it. It's on topic. We'd love to answer that. Great. The next one, I know the answer, but it's not quite on topic. You know, a, a friend got brought up type of thing. What are we going to do? Redirect. I'd love to talk to you about that, but I'm here to talk about this policy. Next one, I don't know the answer, but it's on topic. Offer follow-up. We always encourage you to be honest and never admit that, never try to say something you know that you don't, always offer follow-up and follow through. And finally, oh, I gave you the answer too quickly, <laughs> but um, if you don't know the answer and it's not on topic, redirect and offer a follow-up. And then finally, we'll get to some tricks. So, um, one that we kind of get caught in is we just don't assume that every person that you're talking to knows the issue. Legislators have to know or are expected to know about everything under the sun and going in there with this assumption that they know the ins and outs of health centers the way you do is probably not going to be correct. So just ask them, um, would it be helpful if I provide a brief overview of X, Y, and Z? or are you already familiar with that? And then go into your great spiel about community health centers and all the work that they do. Don't argue with an elected official. It's not productive. And also anger is counterproductive. And so is saying you won't vote again for them because you kind of lost them. And if you don't know the answer, be honest and offer follow-up. Don't let them steer the conversation away you guys are there to talk about something. Let's talk about it. 
that's all I have for tips and tricks. So now we're gonna go into this great panel that we really wanna focus on, so thank you all. So here um, we have Jennifer Schilling and Mike Rohrkast. So Jennifer Schilling recently turned in her state Senate employee badge for a new employee badge at the Dairyland Power Cooperative, joining the government relations team in June of 2020. Dairyland is a generation and transmission electric cooperative based in La Crosse, serving 24 member cooperatives in Wisconsin, Minnesota, Iowa, and Illinois. Jennifer is a recovering elected official after serving 20 years in the Wisconsin legislature representing Western Wisconsin, Jennifer served 10 years in the state assembly and 10 years in the state Senate, where she served as a Senate minority leader from 2015 till 2020. Welcome, Jennifer. And we also have Mike Rohrkast with us. Mike Rohrkast is the executive director of the Fox Valley Memory Project, a 501c3 that supports people living with dementia, their care partners, and families. Previously, Mike served six years in the State Assembly that included two terms on the Joint Finance Committee and over 20 authored bills or amendments signed into law. Before politics, he had a 30 plus year business career, retiring from Oshkosh Co Corporation as the Chief Human Resources Officer in 2014. Welcome, Mike. I'm going to now turn off, um, is this a good idea? Yes, I'm going to turn off my uh, presentation so we can see everyone's faces. And we will get into the first question. Um, well, which, first of all, um, if you have any welcoming remarks, you can include them in this. Um, but my first question is just what, um, what got you all interested in becoming elected officials and why did you choose to jump into the public sector? Sure, I guess I'll, I'll jump in quick first. You know, thank you so much for inviting Mike and I. That's now we're on the speaking tour that we're no longer legislators. This is like my first panel that I have not had a, the Senate title before my name, but I still tell people that I'm still Jennifer Schilling D. LaCrosse, but the D stands for Dairyland. So, uh, this was kind of a little bit of reality to see my name and photo with no title up there. Um, but certainly very happy to join you. And I want to give a shout out. Um, I see Scenic Bluffs is here with Mary and others. Um, I represented uh, that part of the state in the state Senate and Scenic Bluffs did a great job. And I actually have them as examples today that I can use. But it's so good to see you all. Um, and certainly there is life after the legislature. And I'm excited about this new um, chapter that I'm in, but it really is fun. I like to connect about advocacy and in part of my role uh, in government relations at the co-op is working with our 24 member co-ops on advocacy for themselves down at the Capitol or virtually. So, so this is really timely in my new role and um, it's not scary. I don't want anybody to break into the cold sweats. You know, I would introduce myself as a mom with the minivan, right? You know, I might be a senator or the democratic leader, but uh, we all come to our position from various experiences, but it's all about relationships. It's about you know taking the time to educate um, policymakers because you guys are the experts. So I'm excited for the next 45 minutes and, uh, and beyond to kind of talk about this. Thanks for having uh, uh, us here. And uh, Jennifer, it's good to see you. And yeah, we don't have to say Senator or Representative, so you can call us Jennifer or Mike, you know, which I, I never liked that there, being in the legislature. People, oh, well, Representative Rorkast, it's like, oh my gosh, that's so formal. But anyway, so you can call me Mike, please. And I'm sure Jennifer is a Jen, Jen, Jennifer's fine with that. So, um, so. When I retired out of the business community, I actually, I, I, I was I was kind of burned out. I had been in, I had a great career and I really, I wanted to do something different. But at the time I didn't, when I told them I was gonna retire, I didn't know what I was gonna do. And politics was not even in, in I wasn't even thinking about politics. And, um, but I decided to retire and I, I was looking into working actually in the not-for-profit world. Uh, and that's what I'm doing now, interestingly enough. Um, but then the, the person who was in the seat, Dean Coffert, he, um, uh, he left the seat, didn't run for re-election, and I got encouraged to run. 
And then I figured, so I actually ran to try to use my 30 plus years of business community, business experience. Uh, I'd been involved in a number of different not-for-profits, the YMCA, a mental health provider in the area. So I wanted to use that background to really just see what, how I could help in the state legislature. So that's how I got involved. Uh, it was a great six years. I'm so honored that I was able to do it and so glad. And it was great. Um, and healthcare is something that I ended up focusing on quite a bit, particularly senior care issues uh, and, uh, and then very specifically Alzheimer's and dementia. Uh, I had no idea that that's maybe some of the most work I would do when I got into the legislature, but that is a lot, I did a lot of work in that area. And um, it was, it's, it's partially because I know it's a big need, but partially in memory of my mom who had dementia. And so I'm thrilled about what I'm doing now and looking forward to the rest of the questions. See, we still we still could probably take too long, don't we, as, as well, politicians? I was going to say, I don't think I even answered the question. So I really am a recovering poli. I am so sorry. I realized that I was all blabbing about what I'm doing now, but not how I got in. Um, so I'll just quickly say, like, um, I started in local government, and many people do. I ran for county board as a 20-year-old student at UWL, and, and so served on the La Crosse County Board. But I also I worked in the Capitol as a staff person for a member of the Assembly. And I moved back to La Crosse, back to home, and I worked for a member of Congress, Congressman Kind. Uh, and then politics is about timing, and an open seat came available, and I ran for the Assembly like 20 years ago uh, as I was... 30 years old and newly engaged and didn't really understand like really what the, you know, the, the whole job entailed, but I believed in public service and grew up in a family about public service was important. And so um, Mike comes to it from like the private sector and then running later in life. I sort of, that was my early career uh, serving in the legislature and now uh, for the next part of the, my career, hopefully retiring in the private sector. So that's kind of my story to how I ran for office. Great, thank you so much. Um, I would also um, maybe gently encourage people to uh, show their video if uh, you feel like it um, with the panelists. I'm sure that they would like to, to see some faces as they're talking, but no pressure. So the next question, and you're not taking too long. We actually have extra time, Mike. So <laughs> thanks for answering the questions. <laughs> um, so the next question I have are, what are some do's and don'ts of advocacy? Mike, I'll let you go first. We'll go back and forth. Sounds good. So you, um, Carly, you said two things and I would uh, uh, echo those. And the one is make sure you ask what you want the legislator to do. Um, so many times people would come in and they would talk about an issue or they talk about a bill. And then finally, at the end, I would just say, so what would you like me to do specifically? And so it's, it's best to just don't rely on them to ask you, because if you don't, they don't ask you, then they're not, they're going to, if I didn't want to do anything, I might not ask that question. <laughs> so, um, so you, you really need to ask them. If, so if you want them to co-sponsor a bill, if you want them to author a bill, if you want them to do some research into an issue that may affect uh, constituents or your organization, specifically ask them what do you want them to do. They may tell you no, but that's, I mean, that's okay. Then you know you need to find another legislator, but at least you'll know. Um, and you'll know why, hopefully, that they'll, and they, they, they'll, sure, they'll tell you why. I would always if, if say, sometimes I would be called and somebody would say, I want you to co-sponsor, would you co-sponsor this bill? And a lot of times I would, but sometimes I'd say, I'm not sure I'm going to, but here's, and here's why. And then that would at least give them, so it's really important to do that. Um, the other is, is you do need to redirect legislators sometimes because they will start going off on tangents. I did that sometimes, or they will, uh, they will try to not want to talk maybe about what you're taught wanting to talk about for whatever reason. Um, so you got to kind of politely redirect them and that's okay. As long as you do it, you know, like Carly said, in a polite, you know, non-confrontational way, but that's very okay to do to redirect legislators back to the topic. Well, I still have my trusty uh, top 10 tips of how to uh, lobby the legislature that I have 
saved. Um, actually, I had to email my staff and good staff still had that um, 10 months later for me. Um, the first thing is anyone can lobby. So there are registered lobbyists with the state. I would say you all are citizen lobbyists and you have great registered lobbyists with the state. So you have Rochelle and Stephanie, um, I think Tony I looked on, um, Carly, I see Chris Rash is on as well. So representing the 16th Street Clinic. So um, you all are citizen lobbyists. So you don't have to register with the state. That's what I call you as citizen lobbyists, that you are constituents, that you can um, talk to staff and to lobby it or to legislators either at home or in the capital. So, you know, anyone can lobby and, and share their story. I think um, starting early is uh, important. We're in the beginning of the budget season and I kind of tell people the budget is like a five act play. So if you've got legislation that's in the budget, the governor introduces the budget. Uh, now it's in the hands of the legislature where the Joint Finance Committee will get analysis of it and hold public hearings around the state. Later in spring and April or May, they'll start voting on the budget that they put together. And then um, it'll go to the legislature in uh, June for the assembly and the Senate. And then hopefully the governor will have it by July 1st and sign it into law. So it is a, a kind of a five act play with the different branches of government interacting. So. If there are things in the budget, start early to see if it's in there, you wanna keep it in, or if you want to get it added into finance, even on legislation, I think we're up to maybe 100, 200 bills that have been introduced in the assembly and the assembly probably combined 300 bills by now. Um, so get into those legislative offices if they have uh, topics that you have to meet with legislators, asking them to be the sponsor of it or to co-author it. Um, I think it's always helpful when you have bipartisan support of a topic, and so you'll have Democrats and Republicans that both sign on to the bill. So um, I think that is helpful. Um, so the next topic is you can lobby in Madison or at home, like literally from home these days because of the pandemic, and we are all learning how to be effective in this virtual world. And so um, I've talked to many legislators during meet and greets and they actually kind of prefer this because A, they're saving a lot of windshield time and they're not driving from place to place and they're just kind of hacking their day with meetings and they can literally be in Superior for one call and then five minutes later they're down in Beloit talking to people and then over to Western Wisconsin. So um, this affords us a little bit of um, convenience, um, but feel free to, you know, to go to Madison. Obviously COVID, it's you want to be safe, but just try to find safe and effective ways to reach out to people. Um, like was mentioned earlier, don't you, you can work with the legislator staff. They really are the gatekeepers to their calendar and to, to meetings. Um, legislators are super, bu super busy with things. And so meeting with staff is sometimes even better because they're actually the uh, workhorses in the office. And they're the ones that's going to dive into the legislation and get the language right and work on amendments and work with other offices. So um, working with staff is really fantastic. And they can keep you in the loop about legislation and the bill has a hearing or an executive session or if it's on the calendar for the assembly or the Senate. So staff are really great. Um, be factual. Don't exaggerate. Um, sometimes I've had groups that say everybody supports that. Well, I actually know that's not true because I've heard from others that have problems with the bill. So just be factual and don't, don't lie, don't exaggerate. Um, uh, I also tell people to treat the legislator with the same dignity and respect that you expect for yourself. Um, and in this world of really difficult sort of moments and issues and relationships, that's even more important uh, than, than ever. And I really believed in civ civility. Um, and now I think with the advent of social media, that's even more important to be careful about what you write on Facebook, either yours or you're commenting on others because legislators read those. And I had an example of um, a realtor who commented on a story about me on the news and I happened to just click on it. And I saw that he had said something kind of disparaging about myself and said, all I did was whine, whine, whine. Well, Two months later, it was the Realtors Lobby Day and he came down and he was gearing up and leading the day, the lobby of Western Wisconsin. So it was uncomfortable because I knew what he had said about me. And he, of course, um, was a little fake and just said it was a great meeting and appreciated working with me. And after the meeting, and this is 18 years in the job, I had enough guts to talk to him after the um, meeting and call him out on that comment. And so just you don't want to be doing that kind of stuff. It doesn't help relationships and moving forward because legislators and staff are reading that stuff. 
Um, and then just uh, finally, make sure that as a, as a way to build relationships, invite us in on tours, invite us, add us to your newsletters, come in for, you know, invite us on the um, uh, weeks to celebrate, you know, public health centers and things like that. So it's just an ongoing relationship with legislators and staff is kind of the best way, I think, for, for advocacy. Carly, could I add a couple things? And um, of course. two things. One is advocate individually on your own with your legislator. Don't think that they don't pay attention to what people either send in or call or meet with them. Because I know my office did it. I'm sure Jennifer's office did it. We track every call. We track every email, like support or not support for a particular bill. Um, when I was on the budget uh, process, I can speak from the assembly side. Uh, I had other legislators that we were budget buddies and I would get their input. One of the first things that we would talk about is what are we hearing from our constituents? I remember John Nigren who just retired and was chair of joint finance for a number of years. One of the first things he would ask is what are you hearing from your constituents? So don't think that your voice is not heard. May not, you might not think that you're always going to be listened to or you're going to get what you want, but they do hear, they do listen. Uh, to, and it doesn't have to be, you know, a formal thing. Matter of fact, a personal story, that's even better. Uh, the, the cookie cutter, cut and paste kind of emails, th those are okay. I mean, they're not bad because it kind of shows you the breadth. But if you tell a personal story of why you're advocating for a certain issue or a bill, that goes a long way with, with a legislator. Um, the, um, oh, this is terrible. Now, the second thing I was going to do, uh, now I forget. Well, maybe it'll come back to me. Anyway. Can I add two acronyms? Like in my new job, there are so many acronyms in the utility world. I'm always asking what they are. I'm Googling it after the meeting. When you meet with legislators, explain what the acronym is because there are so many acronyms um, in different industries. Sometimes it's the same letters, but it's a different industry. And so I want to just make sure I'm clear on what the acronym is. So I would say explain the acronyms. And secondly, yes, as Mike said, localize it, personalize it. Those are really effective uh, and impactful stories. And I know I got postcards that all said the same thing, but it was signed by people's name and address. And while I get it, it's a volume of postcards. It doesn't really tell me the stories that I can share on the floor of the Senate or in committee and explain things. And so those were two things too that I thought of. This is a real example of how a bill became law. A, 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 a woman who lived in my district Kate brought an issue to my attention that I knew nothing about. And it, it was about mammography and tissue density and reporting in, uh, and um, I, I knew nothing about this issue. But she had such a compelling story of being a mom who was diagnosed in stage three breast cancer, even, and uh, that maybe would have been found sooner if she would have understood tissue density. Anyway, I won't go into the entire bill, but her bringing that story to my attention yeah. literally um, got me and my staff to start working is with um, the UW Medical School, the radiologists, and, and we actually got a bipartisan bill signed into law. Everybody voted for it, and it's going to improve women's health care. In the state of Wisconsin, so it doesn't. No offense to you know Carly and Rochelle, it doesn't have to be a, a lobbying organization that get that brings a bill forward. Literally, a single person can do that. And I'm not. That's not. I'm not the only one. There's lots of examples of legislators who've done the, the exact same thing that I did as a result of somebody being an advocate for an, a, an issue that was not only important to them but important to half the population of Wisconsin. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, the next question I have, um, it might have already been answered a little bit, but um, what information are you looking for when an advocate comes to visit? Um, well, you wanna be clear about sort of what is the goal of the legislation? Um, what kind of support can you build? Is there a coalition of others that could be uh, brought in to support the bill? 
Um, are there points of negotiation that if others who have some concerns with the bill but could support it if it changed this or um, the funding was at this, you know, came from this source or something. So um, I always appreciated a sort of what, where, what's the end goal and are, are there any lines in the sand that you just are like, nope, we can't make that kind of a change. The bill wouldn't be effective or our organization wouldn't support it. So um, I think that's important. Um, patience, um, just recognize that sometimes bills will get introduced and they don't become law for several sessions. And I've had bills like that. And honestly, I was 18 years out of 20 in the minority. And even those two years I was in the minor in the majority, it was like, it felt like 22 minutes. Um, I knew I had to work with the majority legislators, majority folks to get bills and ideas passed. And I would go, uh, and when I was the Senate minority leader, I worked with the majority leader on a bill. We didn't agree on some other policy stuff, but it demonstrated that we as two leaders, Senator Fitzgerald and I could come together on, on an issue that we worked on and we had bipartisan support. So I think um, that's you know important too. Um, again, and it is, um, you know, in addition to that patience, it is uh, just looking to see if this is a, a broad enough bill that the sphere of influence can be larger. It, it is always hard when it's a very, very narrow issue, uh, but that's you know possible too, but making sure that your um, cohorts across the state are also contacting their legislators on this issue. I think building coalitions is really important and impactful. The, um, I think to get a bill passed, legislators in their offices have to be good project managers. So the more that you can help them be a project manager or understand project management steps and project, good project management skills is, is establishing where do you, what do you want to accomplish? So what's the future state? What's the current state? What's the gap? And then you have to overcome all those issues, how to close that gap of between what the current state and what the future state is that you want. And you have to go through, Jen, uh, Jennifer did a great job explaining that but you need to understand project management skills and how you can help the legislators because some of them will probably do it better than others. It depends on their staff, but you have to have good. I, that's one of the things I just, I felt that was, I had a lot of good project management training in my business career. And I used those skills a lot in the legislature. And I know a lot of other people, but sometimes people forget that, that that is really what you need to get something done. And Jen was absolutely right. You gotta have sometimes, you might have a one year horizon on your wish list, but it might take four to five years to actually get it done. And don't get discouraged, keep trying. Awesome, great advice, thank you. Uh, the next question I have is what information do you need to say, yes, I'll sign on? Mike, you wanna take that one first? Sure. Um, a lot of it's already been covered. I think in particular, Jennifer went through a lot of the information that I like to hear. I guess uh, several things that I would always, I would wanna know that the, the counterpoint, um, if somebody comes in and wants me to sign on to a bill, I would, and sometimes I might know the answer and sometimes I might not, but I wanted to know if they knew the answer. Uh, I wanted to know if they knew what the opposition to the bill, if there was opposition and, and how they were going to address that. Um, I wanted to see if they were going to be candid, which most of the time, and I give, I really, um, sometimes lobbyists are given a hard time and a bad reputation and that's not fair to them because I think 99% of the lobbyists that I worked with in Madison were very, very uh, forthright and candid and honest. And um, um, now they, some of them maybe could have done maybe a little more homework and things like that, but they, were, they, they weren't there trying to misrepresent anything. But that's really what, that was probably one of the biggest things that I wanted to understand is, um, particularly, I was not an expert in every area. So I sometimes might shy away from signing on to a bill because I just didn't know a whole lot about it. But if they could convince me that this was a good bill, and if they told me, you know, the reality of what maybe some of the counter arguments might be or what kind of risk I might have by signing on to the bill, that's kind of what I was looking for. That would help me out. 
So sometimes uh, like environmental issues, uh, farming issues, that's not a strength of mine. So I needed a lot of help in that area. So the other thing is know your legislator, I guess, know what they're strong at and what they're not strong at. Oftentimes, yes does not come easy to elected officials. And so um, as a, a new legislator, you will learn, and as, as citizen lobbyists, you will learn, there's a lots of ways to say, you know, maybe let me look at it, I'll think about it, but only yes means yes. And so in giving legislative offices the space to sort of get the information that they need to do some research, to run the traps of, you know, who would be against this bill and, um, you know, what interests are on the other side. So just giving them the space to get to yes at some point. And so just being respectful that they are, we, I still say we as a legislator, but they are jack of all trades, masters of none. And so they really have to know a lot of issues. Um, so getting them, you know, giving them the time, giving them, you know, things that they can research, understanding local support of issues. Um, one example, I had the nurse anesthetist wanted some legislation. I didn't even know what nurse anesthetist did. I couldn't even spell the word. And so they said, we'd love to have you come into the operating room at Gunderson uh, and just see what we do as part of the surgical team. And so um, that was a fun day to get up in my scrubs and follow, you know, um, a nurse to the anesthesiologist and the nurse anesthetist until four or five different operating rooms on different patients and recognizing what they needed to do, what it entailed, short surgeries, long surgeries. So then when I introduced the legislation, I could speak a little bit more intelligently about how uh, it was a seamless surgical team and how they worked with the doctors and the anesthesiologist and things like that. So in your healthcare centers, when you've got a lot of different um, uh, clinicians that, that are there, and if it's behavioral health, if it is dental, if it is chiropractic, pharmaceutical, all of that, let, you know, have us come in for a tour, understand how you're all working together. If you've got uh, interpreters uh, that are working with the patients, um, all of that is just important to know sort of how that all comes together. So um, I think that knowledge is really important to get folks to say yes. Awesome, thank you. The last uh, scheduled uh, WIFCA question um, is what is an advocacy pet peeve? Something that might have bothered you a little bit. Well, I already talked about it. social media rudeness really bugs me. And you know, these people I'd say, oh my gosh, they're probably living in their mom's basement and you know, eating Cheetos at three o'clock in the morning and they're throwing shade at me. Um, you know, and you have to get, I have to, you have to have a tough skin. I totally get it. But I just think social media and being anonymous has just made sort of public life and serving, um, cruel and difficult and actually was one of the reasons my kids are 12 and 15 and now they can like Google me and see what people say about me. It was just like, it was hurtful and stuff. So, um, so just be aware social media, um, etiquette. Um, one thing you already mentioned early on about effectively lobbying, I was just going to say, you know, a lack of contact information for follow up that's super important and when you send emails, make sure you include your phone number or email, you know, in the signature block and I'm sometimes surprised how many people just shoot me a quick email and I'm like, I can only respond to you like I really want to be able to call you so um, those are just like two things that are, you know, relatively minor, um, but I guess civility even you're going to probably meet with people that you may not vote for, uh, but you're going to find common ground on issues. Like you don't have to tell them that you don't vote for them, but uh, they might be, you're going to find, I would always say, look, you may not vote for me, but I hope I'm going to earn your trust and I want to work to represent everyone. And, um, you know, hopefully we're going to find a common ground issue that we can work on together. Maybe you don't agree with me on my position on X, Y, and Z, but this one we can come together and, you know, I would charm and disarm as I'd like to say. Uh, and used my Chex Mix diplomacy that I made homemade Chex Mix and I'd bring it to the finance committee and to my other committees and uh, just try to have some civility with my own um, colleagues. So those were two, you know, I couldn't really think of pet peeves too much because I really enjoy people and learning and being curious about a lot of issues. I would totally agree on the, uh, the social media or what people, it was amazing to me sometimes what people would put in email or in a um, social media 
but then when I would see them face to face, it would be um, a, a very different interaction. And it's, uh, I know when I was an HR human resources person, whenever somebody had a conflict with somebody, I always advised them don't send emails to initiate the conflict or to try to deal with the conflict, go see them, go talk to them. They didn't always listen to me, um, but um, because it's much better because what you put in writing uh, sometimes um, is not always the most diplomatic uh, because you're not there face to face and legislators are people too and uh, they, they, they get hurt just like anybody else can get hurt. They have kids and like Jennifer said, uh, you know, that's, that's in my wife, you know, she was humiliated a few times in public. That's just, that's just sad, you know, and it's a pet peeve. And I, and thankfully though, and I, you know, 99% of the people don't do that stuff, but it's always a good reminder that it's, it's not going to be helpful. Um, then the other pet peeve, it's more maybe just another suggestion is, so a lot of times um, you, you have a you have different groups that are maybe okay with the bill in general, but they're going to want some changes made, some amendments made. And if you're the sponsoring kind of lobbying group that wants it this way, you've got to be open to sometimes those amendments, and, and then you have to be willing to maybe compromise. And or if you're not willing to compromise, at least explain then why, because if you want it done, it, that's what it may take. If you want, so do you want to get? 100% of what you want it, or do you want to get 70% of what you want it? And I'm not saying one or one or the other is good or bad. You have to make that decision. But if 70% is better than 100, you might need to compromise and help with that legislative process of making those amendments to the language to then make it where it can be actually passed into law and you can move the ball forward or however you want to say it. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, so now, uh, thanks for answering those questions from Lipka. Um, we are going to move into um, into questions from the community health centers. So I just want to uh, leave a couple of minutes um, for you all to answer your questions. And then, um, yeah, I'm just going to leave a little space for you all to ask questions. Carly, I do see one in the chat from Mary at Scenic Bluffs. It says we often hear that there's a lot more bipartisanship happening in the building than what you hear about in the news. Um, what are the types of issues that foster that bipartisanship and how can we push for more of that related to primary care and health access? So maybe I'll pose that to Jen first, if you would mind speaking to the issues where you think that's possible or how to frame issues to appeal to a bipartisan group. Yeah. Um Back in the good old days, uh, when we were actually meeting and in person and, you know, we're in the building, um, those relationships like amongst um, legislators, it, it felt easier and it felt easier I don't, for a whole host of reasons, but just as, you know, legislators trying to work together bipartisanly. Um, and it is about relationships and just from the viewpoint of a former legislator and I, you know, when I came in and, and 2000, I was a class of one, a freshman class of one. I was the only new Democrat elected in the assembly in 2000. And so I knew that I needed to introduce myself to my Republican committee chairs and my Republican colleagues um, to be effective and ask for their help on bills and getting things scheduled and then hearings and things like that. And again, like I'm a people person, I've decided I really, I prefer to govern, I don't want to politic. And the partisanship just sort of became a little bit harder and stronger and things changed. And, but I really did try to um, have relationships with those, with my, with, with my colleagues. Um, when I became in the leadership, I would reach out to my Republican leaders and say, let's go have breakfast or have coffee or dinner somewhere away from the Capitol without eyes and ears so that we can kind of talk about things. And I'm kind of a gregarious personality. So, you know, I, I would reach out to Speaker Voss or Senator Fitzgerald and, you know, just to kind of build those relationships, build trust. And I would tell them that we need to work on not just, you know, small T trust, but capital T trust. And that's, you know, working with the governor's office, working with leaders and um, working on, um, you know, uh, finding that that common ground and recognize that we can agree to be, that we can agree to disagree, but we don't have to be so cruel about it. And 
and I do worry about sort of the erosion um, of, of things. Um, there are certainly, yes, a lot of bipartisan bills come through. They don't get the um, headlines and things like that. It's probably the bigger bills and partisanship that's happening. But um, I don't know. I, I kind of feel like everybody needs a moment with Dr. Phil that uh, to kind of come together and kind of work through some things. And I will say after 2011 and the recalls and I came into the Senate, there was a lot of resentment from my fellow senators about how they had been portrayed or vilified in their community, the Republicans. Meanwhile, the 14 had gone to Illinois and come back. And whenever we kind of got a little, you know, cruel on the debate, somebody would yell, stand up and say on the floor, at least we stayed here and did our job. We didn't go to Illinois, you know, like the 14 of you did. And I wasn't part of the 14. I was part of the assembly at that time. So just trying to figure out like relationships my checks mix is, you know, why I brought it to finance with John Nygren and Alberta Darling. And, you know, it was hard for them to like throw a grenade at me on the other side of the finance wall if I had just given them some cereal snack, you know, over in the coffee room while we were having lunch. So it really is on each legislator, I think, to find that common ground and seek out people. I tried to go to a lot of receptions when we were having receptions, and I challenged myself to meet like at least three new legislators. The assembly, there are so many new faces. I didn't know who they were. Um, and I, it is, I think it is, we need to challenge legislators that we, we can uh, conduct ourselves the same way that we would want to conduct ourselves at home if our constituents were always watching. So statistically, like 90% of the bills that are passed have bipartisan support. And that, that was under Walker, that was under, um, that's been under Evers as well. Um, the last budget that was passed is an example of bipartisan work. Um, well, or bipartisan result, because the legislature, I won't say they worked together maybe that closely on it, but it, there, but it was, but it ended up being a bipartisan uh, budget because the legislature passed it and the governor signed it and that was good for the state of Wisconsin. I know the, the governor I'm sure didn't want to sign it. Some of the legislators in the Republican side didn't want to have that but last budget passed but they did and so more bipartisan either results or work happens um, out of the over 20 bills that I had signed into law. I think only actually one of my bills did not have any bipartisan support. And it, it was more of a business partisan issue and I get understand that, um, but all, everything else did. Um, and even some of my bills had Republicans who were against my bill and Democrats who were for it. That was very common too. Um, so bipartisanship actually happens a lot more. And here's, I'll give you my own just sort of personal opinion. When things get public, that's when the partisanship comes out. And I don't have a good solution to stop it, but it, that happens in press conferences. It happens when they're interviewed on the news. It happens on the floor when they're debating bills. I mean, when we, we, when we go to the floor, we know by within 99.9% .9 accuracy what's gonna happen during that session. We know, uh, they know exactly how many votes is gonna be for a bill and not and against the bill, whether it's a partisan or a bipartisan issue. Speaker Voss knows all that, and I'm sure the, on the, the, the Democratic side, they, they pretty much knew the same thing. A lot of it is for, I'll just stop because I don't want to, but it's, it's, theater. It, it, theater. It, it's theater, yes, okay, yeah, it's theater. It's not, it's not what really happens between with the work. All the work is done before they get to those sessions. The, uh, those floor sessions, and I used, that was the, something I used to dread those floor sessions because I like to work on stuff. I like to get stuff done, and all that work was done, and then everything else is. I'm not a theater person, so I have a son who's a theater person. He probably would have loved that. I don't. I'm not a theater person. Anyway, so what? that is a ton of theater, and I wish that would get fixed. Um, the the good thing about where you're coming from and in, in what you're trying to do is is primary care and healthcare access. Both parties recognize that that's a huge need and there's a huge gap in the state of Wisconsin, particularly in the rural areas. So the more that you can show them how you can close those gaps, I mean that's going to resonate. So at least your issue has. I mean there's might be differences of funding and how much funding those can be, but your objective is good. So yeah, you, so that you don't have to worry about, you're gonna have agreement there. You have to find what's the agreement outside of the objective. 
yeah. uh, the disagreements and then work to close those just those of get agreement on points of different disagreement yeah and i looked on some of the issues that you've registered for already this year i mean obviously like covid vaccine deployment the pharmacy benefit managers i think that bill is coming up if it hasn't already been on a calendar and that had strong bipartisan support i think last year we had like over 100 legislators that were signed on to that one uh, support for community health grants, the um, health care shortage, uh, workforce, uh, oral health and dental care has been a bipartisan issue, behavioral health, mental health issue has been um, a bipartisan issue, um, Medicaid expansion, not so much, but maybe we can get there. Um, uh, looking at, um, F um, ment or I said mental health issues, um, so I think that you you guys have a lot of issues that they're, oh, I was going to say broadband and telemedicine. That's what I was going to talk about, that um, every legislator is clamoring to um, be supportive of expanding access to broadband because what that means in education and healthcare and in workforce. So I think you guys are situated well and your issues align well to have bipartisan support on these. Strike while the iron's you. hot on the telemedicine uh, because this is a perfect, you know, one good thing of the pandemic is we have learned that uh, remote learning, working, and healthcare can work. And I know there's issues with coverage and re reimbursements, and you got to try to, you, hopefully that will change. And I think you'll see different, hopefully more support for that in this session, I hope. Great, thank you so much for your candor. And um, political theater is um, a phrase or a saying for a reason. So um, I definitely appreciate that. And um, I think it helps support the, how much work we put into um, reaching out beforehand as well. So thank you for that. So um, Angelica in the chat um, has said, I think people who, want to advocate for community health centers are intimidated to call versus using a generic email because they're nervous that the legislator or staff may ask them a question and they won't know the response. They would like to advocate for community health centers but don't feel they have a deep enough knowledge or feel they need to be an expert in the topic or the bill. What advice do you have for them to help them feel more comfortable and encourage them to keep advocating? Make the call. Um, I, I think, I, I guess my staff would be, and I had multiple people over the six years that I was there, but they, I don't think they hardly ever would question a constituent. They would ask, other than ask, you know, hi, how can I help you? You know, this is Representative Rorkas office. Um, and, and they would say, if, if the person would say, well, I'm calling in because I support AB 100 or I support the, community health partnerships, they would say, okay, that's great. We will, is there any other, is there any more information that you would like to add to that? And then they would keep track of that call. So they would, I mean, um, that's really all that a person needs to do. Um, I mean, if they wanna go into more, they can. If they wanna to talk to the legislator, they can. Um, I would say most legislators are, again, 99, you know, over 90% of them are not, aren't going to make people, they're not going to put them on the spot. They're not going to make them feel tough. Um, you do see some of that in the hearing sometimes where legislators will ask some tough questions that's kind of a, hopefully a gotcha. Again, that's theater. And, and it's, you know, so maybe you want to be careful about going to, to testify in front of a committee, particularly if it's a contentious issue, then, you know, yeah, you might be put on the spot in that. But other than that, I, I and Je Jennifer, unless you disagree, I, I think, I don't, I, I mean, I encourage people. I say, gosh, you know, we're people, they're people, they want to hear from you. Really yes, I, I, yeah, I, generally the, the staff are really respectful and they're not going to be like asking you like gotcha questions and things like that. And honestly, as a legislator, people would ask me a question and say, you know, I don't know, I'm going to get back to you. You as a, as a citizen lobbyist can say the same thing. I'm happy to follow up and I'll get that information back to you. So yeah, no worries. Like it's, you know, it's and plus like over the phone, right? If you want to like just call them and all of a sudden you ask a stupid question, no one's going to see your face and you're like, oh my God, what did I just say that for? So over the phone's almost safer. Um, I just quickly saw in the chat and maybe Mike, you can answer this one because I haven't been on finance for five years, but 
Chris asked about shedding light on how the budget buddy program works. Um, so I can I can only talk to the assembly. Uh, but so um, so in the assembly, so on the republic, I was a Republican. So on the Republican side, uh, each there was um, what six of us or eight of us? No, no six. Or, Too many. Too anyway, many. There, well, yeah, too many. Yeah, too many, Jen. Yeah, I know. Um, so uh, whatever the number was, um, so let's say it was six Republicans on the assembly side, but we had 60 members in the assembly. There was over, a little over 60. So what Nigren would do is, and Voss did, was so like me being on joint finance, I would have 10 of the Republican legislators that we were budget buddies. So my job was to work with those 10 other Republican assembly legislators on what they're hearing from their constituents, what issues that they wanted to hopefully get addressed in the budget. So it was a way to have just communication from all of the caucus legislators back up through the joint finance committee. Hopefully that explains it. It was very helpful to me. Um, as a member of joint finance, because um, uh, you getting on joint finances, you have to be willing to compromise because it's not going to always maybe work the way you want to or think it should work. Um, but you have to really listen to all the legislators too. And you know, I'm talking that that's a is a caucus partisan you know process. But we would listen to both, you know, both sides would have them. There was many discussions we would have with the Democratic, uh, our counterparts on joint finance about how do we work through some of these issues. Again, only when the cameras were off or behind the scenes. Yeah. Well, we are inching very close to the top of the hour. So I want to give everyone um, a couple minutes to log off. Um, but I just want to say thank you so much um, to uh, Jennifer and Mike for joining and uh, um, uh, to all of our community health center advocates for joining the call. Can, um, I, see just one, can I say one yeah. thing quick? Um, just one thing and just to demonstrate sort of the civility and bipartisanship. And Mike, I don't know if you even remember this, but many years ago, the two of us were asked to be uh, to speak to, I think, a nurses association group lobby day over at Monona Terrace. You know what I'm going to say. Um, and I got up to the podium and one of the questions was um, about wor workforce development. And I think Governor Walker and, and there were a Republican bill to talk about how do we need to target um, recruitment of out of state uh, workers to come to Wisconsin. And there was uh, an idea that talked about a, a bill that talked about we need to put up like posters and run advertising in Illinois and on the bus and on the subway. And I got up to the podium. I said, you know, that's one thing. I said, that's really a silly idea. I think we can use our, our dollars much wiser. I don't think we need to do a, you know, a poster campaign in Illinois. And I sat down at the table and Mike gets up at the podium. He says, well, Senator Schilling, I'm the author of that bill and I'll put you down as strongly as, as undecided. So <laughs> Fast forward many years, like the two of us are joking. I mean, you can't take things personally. So, uh, but I just remembered that I kind of like, uh, I just kind of dissed that bill and I didn't even realize it was Mike's bill and he was very gracious about it. And like now we're on a panel together. Well, and that, that bill actually ended up becoming law too. And it had bipartisan support. It had, I mean, I don't, you, you might not have supported, that's okay. I don't think I'm all for it. <laughs> I, I, I know, I had Republicans who were against it, but eventually it did get signed and it got, uh, uh, I think it's the only bill that Amanda Stuck, who's the Democratic next to my territory, she yeah. voted for it, you know, and it, so I mean, it was, yeah, it was, and I, again, I had, you know, so it, it, it's an interesting, by part, or everything isn't as partisan as what it, what the press wants you to, or I don't know if they want you to, what they portray. Yes. Yeah. 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 Or but confrontational. Then, yes. I just wanted to say <laughs> that after five years, I felt like I needed to like have a mea culpa moment. So yes. But thank no, no, you for I, inviting really, us. That was fun. We had a good time. That was, yeah. that's okay. It was fun. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone. And I hope that you have a great uh, rest of the week and a great Wednesday. Thanks yes, everyone. On, onward, upward, forward. You're going to lobby great. You're going to go forward and go, go for change. Do good. <laughs> All the best to everybody. Take care. Thanks so much for joining us. Bye. Bye. Bye.